For over 30 years, it has been my privilege to work in a variety of human service organizations. And the common thread of that work has been about helping people heal from psychological trauma. And it's often been an uphill struggle, but not as you might imagine. It's not just about finding the techniques and interventions that help people heal, although that is a challenge. More often it has been helping the larger systems in which we do our work appreciate the impact that trauma has on people's lives. So imagine my surprise in the last few years when trauma has now become so commonplace in our conversations and in media representations. So the field of human services is embarking on a new approach, an approach called trauma-informed care. In its most basic, simple way, it is a shift in the basic questions that we ask, a shift away from the question of what's wrong with you to a question of what happened to you, and more importantly, how does that continue to live on in your life and impact how you function today? So a trauma-informed approach would seem to call for greater sensitivity and a deepening of understanding. And therein is the paradox. Because quite frankly, as a society, we've been somewhat reluctant to come to terms with what trauma means. After all, the diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD, was not approved until 1980. Now that was a really important milestone for us, but PTSD has always been a limited diagnosis. Limited because it was based on adults' experiences of trauma. Adults who had the ability to describe to us what it was like to live with those intrusive memories of the traumatic event and live with their coping strategies which were so much about avoiding any reminder of the trauma. But the reality is that after decades of research, only 25% of children, even those with corroborated histories of significant traumatic histories, ever meet the criteria for PTSD. Why? Because childhood trauma is so profoundly different. It happens in the crucible of those early critical relationships and can have devastating effect on a person's development. So we owe an incredible debt of gratitude to Dr. Bezel van der Kolk and his colleagues who continue to tirelessly advocate for another additional diagnosis, the one that they now call the developmental trauma disorder. Now that disorder has still not been formally approved, and yet, it offers a very powerful framework for understanding how pervasive and persistent the impact of early trauma can be on a person's development. And not just on the child, but on the adolescent and the adult that they will become if we don't successfully resolve the traumatic reaction. So, what do I mean by human development? I'm going to go real simple here. In good human development, what we expect to see is that a person can reliably perceive the world in a fairly objective way and can problem solve and plan for the future in a flexible way. We expect to see that a person can recognize their feelings and tolerate them long enough to learn from them and most importantly learn to manage them. We expect that a person will be able to develop a stable sense of identity and a capacity for self-efficacy. And we expect that a person will be able to form trusting relationships and rely on those relationships for support and assistance when most needed. Now, all of those domains of human development depend on a healthy, well-regulated brain. Now, in healthy development, what we see by adulthood is that a person's thinking brain and their emotional brain can work well in tandem. So that when we experience stress or distress, the brain is able to cope and get us back to a steady state. This is the foundation of development, and this is the foundation that is so profoundly affected by childhood trauma. 
What we see in a traumatized brain are three really critical um, impacts. The first has to do with that emotional brain becoming literally a survival brain. Why? Because a child growing up in significant trauma has pervasive experiences of feeling fear, unsafe in the very relationships that are supposed to nurture them and guide them, unsafe in their bodies, and unsafe with their feelings, and ultimately even unsafe with their thoughts as they try to make sense of a chaotic and dangerous world. So what we see is a, an individual with a traumatized brain relies consistently on basic automatic survival responses, fight, flight, and freeze. Now those can look very different in a child versus an adolescent versus an adult, but they become automatic responses that brain scientists now tell us literally hijack the thinking brain. So much so that one brain scientist called it a hostile takeover of the conscious mind by powerful negative emotions. Now think about that. The implications of that are profound because we have a core belief that people basically make good decisions or bad decisions. And I think what brain science is teaching us is that it's not that simple, that the traumatized brain cannot reliably access and use the thinking brain to make the kind of decisions that people need to make. The second implication that we see with the brain is that the alarm system in the brain becomes terribly distorted. Now, we all need an alarm system to register danger, right? But if the alarm system becomes so distorted that it perceives danger everywhere, danger in dangerous situations and danger in neutral situations, and most tragically, in situations that most of us would consider good or positive situations. Think about what it is like to grow up with an alarm going off in your head all the time, danger, danger, danger. It is a profound interference in being able to be present and to make use of the resources and relationships around you. Now, the third profound impact we see in the traumatized brain is the ability to appraise the present and to learn from experience. Some have called this that the traumatized brain becomes like Velcro for bad, and Teflon for good. Think about that. It's a pretty profound image, isn't it? I think that speaks to the power of those early experiences in literally wiring the brain. So these profound negative experiences are so powerful and weighty that the good experiences that happen later in life, while important and needed, just simply cannot easily unbalance the early experiences. And so, what do we think about that? We often think that people can't heal, or that they're resistant to heal, or they're not amenable to our services. Because we've built a behavioral health system and we espouse treatments that are more and more short-term. Developmental trauma cannot be healed in the short term. It takes time. Now, the sad reality, too, is that many of the people that most need our help are the most difficult to engage. And so it begs the question, do people with traumatized brains have to get better before we can help them? Makes us uncomfortable to contemplate that. And yet, the answer might be yes, if we persist in holding on to our traditional toolboxes. But the answer should be a resounding no. Never have we known more about how to heal trauma after decades of research in trauma, attachment, and brain science. We don't know it all, but we've never had more information and more hope about what to do in helping access and calm brains so that they can then make use of the services that we already have. Now, some of you may be sitting there and thinking, wow, good luck with that. 
to those of us in the human service field. And clearly, we've got a lot of work to do. But my message today is bigger than that, because trauma affects us all. You have only to look at the work being done by the Center for Disease Control on the Adverse Childhood Event Study that show the profound effect of childhood trauma. Childhood trauma is demonstrated to be not only the most powerful predictor of the things you might guess, like anxiety, depression, substance abuse, and suicide. Childhood trauma is the single most powerful predictor of a host of chronic medical illnesses like cardiac disease. So much so that many researchers now say that childhood trauma is the single most profound public health crisis in our country. What do we do about that? Well, clearly in the human service field we have our work, but we as a community have work to do too. I would ask you to think back to the core of childhood trauma. It happens in the crucible of those powerful relationships. So many people say the hurt happened in the relationship and it takes new relationships to promote healing. The thing is, we can never predict which relationship might be the catalyst that sets a person on a path to healing. It might be a teacher, it might be a coach, it might be a neighbor, a cop, it might be any one of us. So I would ask you to take from this message the idea that we are all impacted by trauma. We are all paying the cost, whether personal or societal. We help people heal when we promote connection to one another and connection back into our communities. That's how we heal the future. So being trauma-informed is something that we all have an interest in. Thank you.